Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to see you guys. It's Mrs. Van, your friendly neighborhood English teacher. And I am really interested. Ooh, I gotta turn on my light. I'm here in the dark. Okay. Um, I am so excited to talk to you about this story. I put this story at what I thought was going to be last um, on purpose because I feel like when you've had the analysis opportunities of the other stories, you can really dive deeply into this one. So I'm really excited to hear what you have to say and how you feel about it. So I want you to consider, and I actually saw some of this going on in the chat, but I want you to consider of all the stories we've read so far, which story do you think that this one is most like? So of all the stories that we've read so far in the class, which story do you think this one most reminds you of? And it doesn't have to be an obvious connection, right? Um, it can be subtle. That's fine. But I'm just curious, which story do you think this one is most like? And so I'll watch those come in. Now, as a reminder, um, I have decided to extend this through Monday. And so I have the link here to Monday's story. So I picked a story for Monday and I'll show this link again at the very end of class. And I will also put it up as a document in today's folder. And I will also put it on the Gifted Guru Facebook page. So I'll put it in all the places. Um, oh, I'm, I'm curious about seeing this. Like I got a cask of Amontillado vibe from it. Yeah, I think a lot of people are seeing that. And the necklace, interesting. Cool. Okay. Oh, I love looking at those. Ooh. Okay. Um, this is story for Monday, and I'm going to talk more about it at the end of class, but this is where you can go get that link, and again, you'll see it again. Um, ooh, that idea of to build a fire because people learn their lesson too late. Ooh, there's so much interesting stuff going on. I, I just want to give you guys a shout out um, about yesterday, the chat. It was so good. It was the chat added to the experience for people in the class and to the experience people watching it later. And I'm really grateful to all of you for making that happen. And I'm very excited about that. And I know that I don't need to give another mini lecture to have that be the experience again today. All right, so scale of one to five, one to five, you guys. Let's see, give it to me. A one is you hate it worse than anything, like you'd rather just sit and eat spoonfuls of salt and a one and a five is that you just you love it like it you just love it you think it has so much in it you think everybody should read it so let's see oh okay gonna see so whoa somebody really liked it 4.99879 so of course we round up lots of four ishness high fours and fives coming through a 3.6 nice um, somebody trying to do, looks like imitating dig digits of pi. So let me give a shout out to some of the stuff in the comments yesterday. And again, the comments yesterday were really, really great. Um, so I, this comment, um, I appreciated because this was for the discussion about the behavior in the comments. So I didn't put this person's name just in case they didn't want it, but a number of you actually said that. And so I'm glad that you took it well. Um, and so I, I already said, I don't think I need to say it again, but remember we're just giving one warning this time and then voting you off the island. All right. Um, and then a bunch of well wishes for the surgery I have to have in. Oh, that was so sweet. You guys are so nice. Thank you for that. And then this comment from Heidi Davis really struck me that you guys should write journals about this time, just like Anne Frank during World War II. And I just, I, that is so true because, you know, when Anne Frank was writing her diaries, she had no idea that anybody would ever write it. She was just writing about her day-to-day -day life. And now we have this real insight into what really happened. And the same is true for you guys. So nice. Um, and then Nicole saying, knowing all of this makes it so much more meaningful. And Nicole, you hit on it for all stories. And my husband and I, when we were walking our dog last night, I was, we were talking about the idea that 
I've really gone back and forth as an English teacher of like, should I have people read the story first and then explain it? Or should I explain it first and then have them read it? But I think it's more important to read it first and then have it really explained to you because when that happens, then you understand that you can get more out of it when you understand it. And so when you encounter a piece of literature that hasn't, you haven't been invited to read that, you know, that you just randomly encounter if at first you notice anything, you'll remember, hopefully, that, oh, there was a lot um, in those other stories that have been explained to me, and maybe this one has more in it, too. And so I feel like it just gives you more of a life skill to do it this way. So, um, no, Mr. Van is not a teacher, too. He is a software developer. So, um, and then Deb Coatney, the family's well, the main family's wealth, and she's talking about the family in the home that we read yesterday, it doesn't come from money. And this is the key point, right? And it's, that is such a key point. And then this, uh, this is one of the uh, examples of color. And I just want to thank you guys so much for that, because I went back and read all those colors, and I just felt like all this rainbow was exploding in my mind. It was beautiful. The gold that gets squeezed from the horizon as the day comes to an end. I just love that idea of squeezing the gold in the horizon. That was beautiful. Um, and the who needs journals when we have primary sources like TikTok? I'm glad you're joking because that is not even close. All right. Uh, Simon, home is where you trust the toilet seat. And I thought that was just really, really funny because it's kind of true. And Carly is absolutely right. Mr. Van works with her mom. Um, and, si um, and Simon right here, I used to teach just right down the hall from his mom. So, um, and then Kira says that Brooks does herself justice with her beautiful craft and how she describes everything so vividly. She really makes us feel there and emotionally involved and attached. And I think that is um, really awesome. Um, I, I loved that description of how Brooks did herself justice because that was one of the questions that we asked. How did she do herself justice? All right, so ready to jump into the story. Here we go. Again, just like always, we're going to do a um, uh, we're going to do a plot revisit just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So this story, uh, we have our backstory, our exposition that there had been this party of intellectuals fifteen years earlier, and at that party, the banker and the lawyer make a bet. Now, in some ways, this story is somewhat like To Build a Fire in that we don't know the names of characters. We only know them by their occupation. We have the gatekeeper and we, ha right? and we have the lawyer and we have the banker. Um, and they make this bet. And that sets this story in motion. And the years go by. This is the rising action. The years go by and the banker has lost his money. We know that. Um, and the man is in the lawyer is in confinement. And then the climax, I think, I'm interested to see if you have different views. You know I'm always interested in your different views. Um, that the banker breaks into the prisoner's room so he can kill him, so he doesn't have to pay him the two million, only to find that the prisoner has planned to leave early anyway. Dun, 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 dun. And then, and, and that's the, like, always the climax. That's the music for the climax, right? Dun, 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 dun. And then the falling action, the banker goes back into the house. The lawyer actually does leave the house early. And that's discovered by the um, keeper person. And then the banker takes the note that the lawyer wrote and locks it in a safe. And then that's how it ends. Now, interestingly, at least I think it's interesting, the story originally had a third part. You may have noticed in your copy that there's like a one up here and then partway through it goes to two, which is where it goes back to the present day. Um, right here, there's a two. Well, in the original version, there was a three where the lawyer comes back and demands money of the banker. Um, and it's almost impossible to find it online, but it is kind of interesting. Uh, at Deb Coatney username, the rising action took up like 95% of the story material. Absolutely. And that's common. That's actually a really common dynamic. So curious if any of you have any different thoughts. Um, looks like many of you are six for six on this. This one isn't as 
uh, nuanced as some of the others. This one has a much more clear kind of traditional plot development. We see the inciting incident very clearly, which we haven't in the last couple of stories. Um, so there we go. All right, so let's jump into the story itself. When you see me look to the side over here, I'll, I'll show you. It's because I have another computer perched up here um, on top of a big pile of copies of one of the books that I wrote with my friend Ian. And uh, so I stack up those books and I put my computer here and I have the PowerPoint open so that I can look at the notes that I want to share in addition to, to what's on the screen. So if you see me glance over here, that's what I'm doing in case you want the inside scoop. All right, so we have this first line and we know that this is a flashback and we can already tell because the banker says he was thinking about the party that was 15 years before. So it's no secret, it's a flashback. Um, and then we can already tell that this is not a happy moment for him, that he's not thinking about a happy party because it's on a dark autumn night, right? If he were thinking about a party that had been 15 years ago that was happy, uh, that is not how Chekhov would describe it. He wouldn't set it up as this like dark and stormy night, right? He wouldn't be pacing. Um, pacing implies nervousness or anxiety or worry, right? And so he wouldn't be pacing. He'd be like, you know, just casually hanging out, relaxed. So we get a lot of information. Okay, so at the party, they're having this discussion about which is worse capital punishment or life in prison. And I decided to share with you because some of you may not know why capital punishment is called capital punishment. By capital punishment, we mean the death penalty. So a capital crime is a crime that could earn you the death penalty. And it's called capital from the Latin word that meant by the head, meaning like of the head. And it referred to like beheading. And so a capital crime was one that like a long time ago, they might cut your head off. Or unfortunately, if you're a terrorist now, that you might still do that. But um, that's where that word comes from. That's what capital means here. And I think this is kind of a weird topic for a party, but OK. And they use an interesting word that I think we need to clarify a priori. And um, I, I feel like I, I mentioned my mom a lot in here, but when I was growing up, my mom and I liked to sail and um, our friends had a boat called A Priori. So um, relating to, it means relating to denoting reasoning or knowledge that comes from thinking things through, right? A Priori knowledge means that you think of things, you think them through, you don't necessarily rely on observation or experience or research, you're relying on your own kind of deductive reasoning. And so that's that's what the host says, right? If you can judge a priori about the difference between capital punishment and life in prison, meaning if you can judge it just based on reasoning, not experiencing it, right? Well, that's kind of ironic because now they're about to experience it. So in the party, they come up with this idea that the problems with capital punishment are that it's obsolete, it's immoral, it's not Christian, and they're a Christian state apparently, and the problem with life imprisonment, and this is brought up by the lawyer, is that it kills by degrees and that that's worse than, um, than capital punishment. So that's, that's the discussion that goes on. And then one guy at the party, interestingly, says they're both bad. And I thought, in actuality, this was the far more interesting argument than any of them made, which was the state has no right to take away what he can't give back. And I thought that was such an interesting idea. And I thought you could really dive into just that one idea for a long, long time. Does the government have the right to take something away that it can't give back? Because we know that some people are wrongly convicted. So is it fair to, like, if you can't give someone's life back, is it fair to do it? And then what are the unintended consequences of something like that? So I thought that was a really interesting idea. I thought that guy was good. Um, and then here comes our lawyer, and he says this. It says the lawyer's young. It says he's about 25. And I think it's interesting that the narrator doesn't even pretend to know how old the characters are. Like, he's about 25, and the banker is old. And that's it. That's all we get. 
All right. Um, and Deb Coatney, yes, if you experience capital punishment, you can't share their experience afterwards. <laughs> Absolutely true. Very good. <laughs> Very good. So he says this, it's better to live somehow than not to live at all. And then there's more conversation and then we get the bet. And the terms of the bet... Um, Oh, I see Canari asking, a Christian state, do we know where this happens? No, Chekhov was Russian, and Russia was Christian prior to the communist revolution. And so he he's probably referring to Russia, and it would at that time have been a Christian nation. Um, okay, so they make this bet, $2 million that he's going to stay locked up, um, that the lawyer is going to stay locked up for 15 years. And... Um, and this is interesting because the banker tries to talk the lawyer out of it. And he tries to talk. He's like, you couldn't stay there five years. And the banker's like, or the lawyer's like, I'll do 15. And the banker is like, wait, hold on. Right. Like voluntary imprisonment is much heavier than enforced. Right. The fact that the idea that you'll be able to leave at any time will poison your whole life. And I think this is interesting. And. I think it reminds me of a story that we discussed earlier when we talked about our things that are hard in your life, hardships in your life that you bring on yourself. Are they more difficult because you know you brought them on yourself than hardships in your life that are inflicted on you? And we decided as a group that they were. And so I wondered if you had the same feeling about this because I think it's a very similar argument. Now, here's an official question for you. Which do you think would be harder, to be forcibly locked away or voluntarily locked away, knowing if you left, you'd give up all of the money, and of course, all of the time that you'd already stayed there would now be useless. So what do you think would be harder? Looking at it, we'll see this. The, Kieran asked this question, why did he, I hope I say, pronounce your name right, but why did he want to say 15 years when he could have just done five? I think that's a question really worth exploring. Um, and it's on, um, let's see, it it's on the first page, if you, if you printed it out, it's on the first page and it says, uh, the banker says, it's a lie, I bet you two million, you wouldn't stick in a cell for even five years. And he says, uh, if you mean it seriously, then I bet I'll say not five, but 15. And I feel like it's like an episode of Dumb and Dumber. Like, I, I'm going to make this ridiculous thing and I'm going to up you on your ridiculousness. So, yeah, you're right. it's, it's a weird thing. So it seems like most of you feel that voluntary would be harder, but a couple of you feel that forced would be bad. So interesting. Okay, so... Um, we needed to find another word because it comes up twice in the story. It's used twice in the story. It's actually a good word. This is a strong word to have. I think you should add this to your vocabulary toolbox. And my mom had a suggestion. I think it's true. I think it's a good suggestion that you obtain a little notebook. And I don't think it needs to be fancy. You could do like one of these, um, you know, composition notebooks like this. Um, it doesn't need to be fancy, but have some kind of notebook where you keep your words. Keep the words that you like and that you come across and that you think are important and that you think you can use and add them to your vocabulary toolbox. It's good to have them in a single place because it's nice to be able to flip back through them and you want all the words. So capricious is an important word to have. It has a lot of applicability and usefulness. It's a very useful word. Um, so what it means is that you're given to sudden or unaccountable changes of mood or behavior. So these are people who you just, they act in ways that you can't count on, you can't predict. They're unpredictable in a way that is often thoughtless to the extent of almost, um, like in a religious sense, sinfulness. Like you're just capricious. You're just like, you'll do this and you don't even think of the consequences. And then you change your mind right away and you're just going back and forth and nobody knows what to expect from you. Capricious, fantastic word. All right, so for the bet, terms and conditions apply. Uh, the lawyer cannot leave, which is kind of obvious, but he can't leave. He's not allowed to see or hear humans or voices. He can't have any letters or any newspapers. He can have a musical instrument. He can have books. He can write letters, right? He can't receive them, but he can send them out. He's allowed to drink wine and he's allowed to smoke tobacco. 
Now, friends, neither of these would do me any good because I'm Mormon. <laughs> I don't drink or smoke, but, so I would have an even more restricted list. Um, but he can communicate in silence through the little window. So he can like send out notes and we see that happen in the story. Um, so those are, those are the rules. And my question for you is, I, this is one of the questions in the whole two weeks that I've been so excited to ask you is what rules would you change, take away or add? What rules would you change, take away or add? And Tabitha, yes, like your own dictionary, like your own dictionary, the dictionary of words I love or care about or think will be useful to me dictionary. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. So I'm curious about whether you want, um, oh, Christiana, yes, he does want wine and tobacco. It comes up later. I'm just saying it wasn't helpful to me. Um, musical instrument helpful. Yes, I'm looking for. Hey, Happy's also LDF. That's so cool. That's fun. Um, what rules would you change, take away, or add? I want to see it. Let's see. What would you do? What should we add? Erin says she wants to add the rule that she gets to eat whatever she wants. They do bring food. It doesn't say whether he gets to pick the food. That's an interesting idea. Anna says she'd be allowed to receive letters. Oh, Caitlin, a pet. Ooh, that would really change it, wouldn't it? I mean, although 15 years, it would be hard to find. You'd, you'd have to have like a cat or a long-lived bird because most dog breeds don't live that long. Um, hey, Jim, that's awesome. That's fun unlimited food and drink to be able to hear her voice um I don't know whose voice you mean but just to be able to hear voice it's nice um yeah so that's so cool all right some interesting rules I knew you guys were gonna come up with it I knew you were gonna come up with interesting rules all right so now we have let me um we have the differences between the two characters the banker is old the lawyer is young the banker is very wealthy the lawyer doesn't really say but we know he's a young lawyer he can't have that much money unless he had it from his family which i don't think he does or else he wouldn't have done something so silly and then the banker is capricious the lawyer is thoughtful and we know what capricious is because we just put it in our personal dictionary of wonder words all right so these characters are this way and i want to separate this out right now because i want us to look at them again come back to this at the end of the story and see do we feel that they have really changed and in what ways have they changed okay oh deb Cotney says exercise equipment that you would want in this story. oh yeah that would make a big difference too all right so let's go through the years of the confinement because the story really details out how he behaves all right so in the first year says they know and they know this because people are watching him through the window like they can't communicate with him apparently but they can watch him it didn't make a lot of sense to me to be honest because could he not like be dancing in front of them and be having contact which seems like a pretty solid form of contact but in any event they can see him so he's lonely and bored he plays a lot of piano um he doesn't use any wine or tobacco and he reads light books like basically like beach reads right he's reading just like super light books nothing deep thinking next the second year, he doesn't play the piano and he only reads classic literature. Then the fifth year, then they skip years three and four. The fifth year, he doesn't do any reading. He just listens to music and drinks a lot of wine. He spends a lot of time lying on his bed, um, talking angrily to himself, writing and crying. And I would just like to do another PSA that drinking a lot of wine doesn't seem to have done him any good in the same way it didn't do Fortunato any good. So maybe there's a takeaway here. All right, the second half of the sixth year. So we don't hear anything about the first half of the sixth year, but the second half of the sixth year, he's zealously studying languages, philosophy, history. He reads 600 books in four years. Now, I think some of you are thinking, well, if I were locked in a room and that's all I had to do all day, kind of like now, um, then I would read a lot of books too. This doesn't seem like that many books. But consider, this isn't divergent, right? This isn't a lightweight novel. These are heavy reads. These are books that you're not going to just plow through. These aren't books that you're just going to sit down and read in a couple of hours. So this is a lot. And this was interesting then. He sends a note out and it's the it's the only note that we're told that he sends out in the whole time. And it's at the top of page three. And he, he says, like, he's been studying these languages. And he says, I've written these lines in six languages. Show them to experts, like language experts, and let them read them. And if they don't find a single mistake, I beg you to give orders to have a gun fired off in the garden. And 
I, I just, this really just struck me about, about it. And I, I don't want to influence your responses to my next question by telling you what it made me think about. So let me show you the question I have about this. Why does he care what language experts he doesn't even know and will never meet? Why does he care what they think about his abilities, about the languages that he's learned? Why do we seek feedback? Curious about that. Let's see what the committee. Sophie and Stella has an interesting idea. Heavy reads would give him time to think through things with throughout the book, right? Might give you more more to digest than than something lightweight. Yeah, nice. All right, so I'm interested to see why you think he wants this feedback. And then they fire two shots. It says that he sends this letters out. The prisoner's desire was fulfilled. Two shots were fired in the garden. Why two shots? What do you think that means? Ooh, Deb Coatney says dopamine. Uh-huh. Yeah. We get feedback. We, we get feedback and we want to know, is he, oh, I love these answers. He wants to see if his efforts were wasted. He wants to see if he's grown. People are always striving to look accomplished in the eyes of others. Interesting. If you think about it, it's a way to have human contact. Absolutely. Kurt Kemmer, human nature is based largely upon pleasing critics. Interesting. Um, I think we definitely seek feedback. There is, what I wanted to mention to this is that, about this, is that there have been studies done about this, about how people, even if they're doing something that they love, if they don't get any feedback, they won't keep doing it. And they will do something even if it's not even if it's kind of below them if they're getting really good feedback like if you do something that you don't like doing and your mom or dad tell you how meaningful it was to them like how much it helped the family or moved the family forward or did something in some way that really meant something to somebody you're more willing to do it even if you didn't like the thing so the two shots i'm looking to see I, I thought no, but I don't. I haven't seen anybody who said yet what I thought it was. I thought it was that two of the experts thought it was really good, um, of the six. That's what I read. Um, so I'm curious. So Christiana says like washing dishes. Yeah, getting feedback. If yeah, if they tell you. So yeah, Kurt Kemmer don't understand why they fired two shots. I, I think it's that he got two of them right that's always what I've thought I read this story the first time in high school and that's what I thought some of you think it means that he was exceptional um I don't know interesting we'll never know right we'll never know because Chekhov is dead okay in the 10th year he only reads the New Testament it and it says this about the banker the banker found it strange that a man who in four years had mastered 600 erudite volumes should have spent nearly a year in reading one book easy to understand and by no means thick and my question for you is do you think that says more about the lawyer or the banker I guess you could analyze if you want the lawyer or the banker or more about the New Testament what is it what does it say more about that you could spend an entire year reading one book what does that say Now in the next year, we get this. There's an unknown year. It doesn't say what year it is. It just says another year, right? We don't know. He spends the whole year reading history or, oh, that should be history of religion, typo. Hey, thank you guys for finding a typo in yesterday's shout out there. Um, this should be history of religion and theology. And then the last two years, he does this extraordinarily haphazard reading. He's reading all the things, right? It, it says, he was reading like natural. He was reading everything. And it described the way that he was reading. He read as though he were swimming in the sea among broken pieces of wreckage. And in his desire to save his life was eagerly grasping one piece after another. So interesting. I, I just love this writing. I mean, does anybody else read like this? I mean, I think for many of us, it's not hyperbole to compare reading to life-saving, right? Like, I think for many of us, reading is a lifesaver. Like, um, there are quotes from famous people, 
books are friends that never fail me. And so this is really interesting. I loved this idea of this. I just loved this beautiful, beautiful simile here. Um, somebody questioned if you ever read the dictionary. That would be interesting. I loved, um, oh, there was a typo in the writing prompt. Ooh, sorry, Anna. Um, I love reading what you said about what it, the reading of the New Testament and his surprise that he would take a year in it, what that said about them. You had some really interesting insight into that. Okay, so the time goes by, but there's a little bit of a problem. So we're up to the 15 years, and here's the issue. Uh-oh, the money's all gone. The banker has invested in the stock market and lost all of his money, and now he doesn't have the $2 million to pay the lawyer. And so he has this discussion with himself. That cursed bet, right? Why didn't the man die? He's only 40 years old, right? Talking about, because he was like 25 before and now it's been 15 years. So the, the lawyer is 40 years old now. He's only 40. He's got his whole, like he's still got a lot of his life to live, half his life to live at least, right? He'll take away my last farthing, marry, enjoy life, gamble on the exchange, just like he did, right? What the banker is saying is, he's going to have the life I should have. And I will look on him like an envious beggar and hear the same words from him every day. I'm obliged to you for the happiness of my life. Let me help you. And this, this pride, right? This is pride. He's worried that then now the lawyer will have more than he does and the, and the lawyer will offer to help him and that the tables will be turned and he can't stand it. No, it's too much. This reminds me so much of Montresor in Cask of Amontillado. Like, it, it, this, like the insult is what does it. It's not even the idea of not having enough money or being able to afford things. It's having to humble yourself. I, I, it is so spot on. We see this theme again and again and again in literature because it's so common in people. The only escape from bankruptcy and, bankruptcy and disgrace is that the man should die. Oh yeah, okay. Whenever I realize that I'm gonna run out of money, my first thought is, who can I kill? I mean, it's so, it's so ridiculous. I mean, I just feel like it's crazy. It's just absolutely crazy that he's literally going to murder someone so that he can keep his pride. I just, it's so interesting. Okay, so um, then in what ways do you think the banker is the real prisoner in what ways do you think the banker is the one who's really in prison I see Jane Packer did some math about how many pages per day which is 82 which doesn't sound like a lot but have any of you ever read 82 pages of a textbook every day like a hard textbook yeah it's not the same as the Hobbit it's different but thank you for the calculation I love it that's like the second time we've had some math thrown down I love that all right, so let's see here. In what ways is the banker the real prisoner? I'm looking forward to seeing that come through. All right, so then we have this. This is the moment. This is the moment. And Chekhov describes it well. In the house, everyone was asleep. And one could hear only the frozen trees whining outside the window. So we've got even the trees are alive, right? We've got personification and the trees are whining. And it is very common that in stories there will be a climax in the middle of the night we see it in how the grinch stole christmas right like even even stories like that it's like in the middle of the night um even in if you guys ever remembered reading the picture book madeline in the middle of the night miss clavel turned on the light and said something is not right right it's common that stuff will happen in the middle of the night okay so trying to make no sound so and that's another common trope is silence quiet trying to be quiet of course, you're going to try to be quiet when you don't want to get caught murdering someone. He took out of his safe the key of the door. Notice that construct. He took out of his safe the key of the door rather than he took the key of the door out of his safe. It's an interesting choice. Anyway, which had not been opened for 15 years, put on his overcoat and went out of the house. The garden was dark and cold. Notice these words that are telling us I've got tone words in blue and I've got personification in purple. Ooh, 
I just got distracted by your comments about how the banker is really the prisoner. Okay, the banker is prisoner to his own conscience, that he might have made rash decisions on one night many years ago that could ruin the remaining years of his life. He's a prisoner to debt and shame. Ooh, ooh, ooh. He made his own prison with his bad decisions. Oh, it is so interesting. Ooh. Um, okay, so, and Ryan points out the irony that the key was in a safe, but the lawyer wasn't safe. Ooh. Wow, wow, that is great. Okay, so it's raining. A damp, penetrating wind is there. So we've got all these these tone words going on. How the author, Chekhov, is helping us feel the creepiness of this, the sinister nature of what's going on, mimicked in the setting. And the wind howled in the garden and gave the trees no rest. So this personification again. These trees are still alive. He comes back to these living trees. like They're almost like people. And the old man says, if I have the courage to fulfill my intention, thought the old man, the suspicion will fall to the watchman instead. Wait, what? You're going to, not only are you going to kill the guy, but you're going to make sure that somebody else takes the blame for you. A guy who works for you, who you have like stewardship over and should be taking care of and protecting both of these people you're supposed to be taking care of and protecting. And you're going to kill one and throw the blame for the death of the other on one? What do you think would happen to the watchman if they found the lawyer dead and blamed the watchman? What kind of crime do you think that is? I think that's capital crime. So really he's willing to kill two people. He's willing to kill two people. I'm like, dude, you are a bad dude. And he gets there, he gets in there and this is our first glimpse of the prisoner. This first thing we see, we've heard about what he's been doing but we haven't seen a description of him physically. Before the table, meaning in front of the table. Look at that preposition. We think of before as meaning like it happened before something. Like, oh, I, I ate lunch before I went on a walk. But before can also mean in front of. Okay. Um, all right. So before the table sat a man unlike an ordinary human being. It was a skeleton. I highlight that because he's like not even a person anymore. Not even a person anymore. With tight drawn skin, trying to make it more like a skeleton. Uh, I bet that looked cool, right? Okay. Um, long curly hair like a woman's. I mean, obviously, the hair is going to be long because he hasn't had anything cut it, probably. And a shaggy beard. Um, the color of his face was yellow, of an earthly shade. So it's almost like he's almost returning, like he's he's almost a corpse. His cheeks are sunken. The back, his back was long and narrow. The hand upon which he leaned his hairy head was lean and skinny. It was painful to look upon. I feel like he's making him look like Gollum in Lord of the Rings. His hair was already silvering with gray, and no one who glanced at the senile emaciation, interesting word, senile, we usually associate that with, like, out of your mind, of the face would have believed that he was only 40 years old. So he's, like, way, way, way older looking than you would think. And Amelia makes Amelia J makes a comment. This also goes back to the capital punishment argument at the beginning. Yes, nice, absolutely true. Okay. Um and Mosley picked out the golem, I think, even before he heard me say it. So there you go. Oh, and Clawful, he's decomposing. Yes. 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 Yes, you're right. He's decomposing. He's made it look like he's he's seeing the lawyer through the banker's eyes as if the lawyer is already decomposing. What effect does that have? It makes it the banker feel like, oh, well, it's okay for me to kill him because he's already almost dead, right? So I wonder, did the banker really, or I'm sorry, did the lawyer really look this bad to other people or was it just the banker trying to make himself feel better? Like, oh, he's halfway to the grave anyway. So question, do you think this type of imprisonment has to change you this drastically physically? Like, do all people who come out of this kind of prison, remember, he can't go outside, so it's not like regular prison now where we let people outside for fresh air. Is it, is it, does it have to change you this drastically physically? I'm just curious. And Elizabeth Heyer says, no vitamin D. Yeah, I mean, vitamin D, powerful. So interesting. Okay, so I'm looking, looking forward to that, your answers to that. And then we get to the letter, the letter. So the banker finds the letter that the lawyer has written and he picks it up and he says, on my own clear conscience is before God who sees me. And I think that's an important line to remember is that through all of this, he retained his religion. And that's kind of interesting because of all that he says after this. I feel like 
it's kind of out of alignment with what he says later. I declare to you that I despise freedom, life, health, and all that your books call the blessings of the world. Like he sees himself as not even a part of the world anymore. He calls it yours, like not just books, but your books. And there's this beautiful language moment where he talks about all of the experiences he's had in reading. And he des he describes um, this as like clouds ethereal. And I just love that language. So ethereal means that it's so perfect that it doesn't seem like it could even belong to this world. And I wonder if any of you guys can... Um, can relate to this. Have you ever seen when this, it's like kind of cloudy, and but the sun is there and the rays of the sun come through the clouds and you can see the individual rays actually coming in. I always feel like it's like, God, you know, it just looks so cool like that. I feel like he captures, he captures that moment like clouds ethereal. He says in the, in the letter, in your books, right? In your books, I did all of these things. I climbed the summits of El Brut and Mount Mont Blanc and saw from there how the sun rose in the morning and the evening suffused the sky, the oceans and lime mountain ridges with a purple gold, right? It's so interesting. I saw how, I saw these green forests. I saw this. I, I heard sirens singing and playing the pipes of Pan. I cast myself into bottomless abysses. I burned cities to the ground, right? Like he's, he's, uh, there's a lot of illusion going on here too. Mythology here, he's talking about um, essentially like Rome burning, I think is what he's making an allusion to. Um, I conquered whole countries. So maybe he's talking about Alexander the Great or Genghis Khan, right? He's like, I did all of these things. I did all of these things in the books. Your books gave me wisdom. I know that I am cleverer than you all. In what ways is this not true? In what ways is he not clever? In what ways is he not wise? Knowing what happens next, right? You know what he's going to do and what he says. What, what do you think is unwise? Honey says, I always think, Scotty, beam me up when I see the rays. That's hysterical. And Christiana says, God raises what I call them. So yeah, I'm not the only one. There we go. Oh, Ryan Whitmore, it could have been a reference to Napoleon, Heidi Davis, Julius Caesar. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll be looking for those coming in. And he says, I despise your books. I despise all worldly blessings and wisdom. And I'm like, now wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Both of these guys are confusing me. The banker is going to kill the guy and cast the blame on someone else which you have to admit is kind of crazy. And now the lawyer says, the books have made him wiser, right? The books have made me wise, but I despise the books and I hate wisdom. That just makes no sense to me. Like, I learned all this wisdom from books, but I despise the books. And I thought, ah, oh, that's so weird. But then I thought to myself, how? A lot of times people will, once they've obtained either money or fame, they will despise or dis have disdain for their roots or where they came from. And I thought maybe that's what's going on here, that he's kind of like gotten, I don't know, a saying that you would hear is like too big for his britches kind of thing, where he, he feels so superior to everything that he doesn't even have respect for the thing that got him where he is. I don't know. Curious about what you what you think about that. He says, he's, he makes this accusation about us, essentially, right? He's making this accusation about everybody who's not as wise as him. And he says that we would marvel if owing to strange events of some sorts, frogs and lizards suddenly grew on apple and orange trees instead of fruit. And he says that as a criticism. And I'm thinking, yeah, because that would be really weird, right? Like it's, it's such an interesting thing. It's such an interesting criticism to make. And then I don't know what he means by this one either. Oops. You have bartered heaven for earth. I, I'm not sure what we're supposed to understand. Are these the ravings of a madman? Like, is that what Chekhov wants us to believe that the guy's crazy? 
Or is he so much more wise than we are that we can't really understand what he's saying? And in here, is he saying, remember that he mentioned God in the beginning? Is in here he's saying, I understand now that there's nothing on earth that's as important as faith? I'm not, I'm asking that like that as a question. Is it faith? Like, is he, is that what he's saying here? That you've traded, you, you've traded away heaven in exchange for earth and that's meaningless. I'm not sure. Like he's saying, I've read all there is to read. I know all there is to know. I have experienced all there is to be offered by earth and found that it's not worth this. I'm not sure. It's an interesting idea. Um, and then he, and then here's this incredible moment that I may show you indeed my contempt. I waive the two million, which I once dreamed of as paradise and which I now despise that I may deprive myself of my right to them. I shall come out from here five minutes before the stipulated term. He's going to come out five minutes early on purpose. And I, I think that's really interesting. I don't know. I don't know though. If, if the lawyer had submitted this to me as a response in the folders like you guys have been doing, I don't know that I would have felt that he had proven his point. I think I may have said, as some of you have seen me write, hmm, I'm not sure you prove this point. And I'm not sure that he does here. I don't, I don't know that he proves that it's better to know things than to live your life. I, I just don't know that he's proved his point. So there's this double irony. The banker no longer has the money, so he's going to kill the prisoner. But the prisoner is deliberately spurning the money, so the banker lets him live. It's just so weird. And so when the banker reads the note, he puts the sheet on the table, kisses the man, and begins to weep. And he says he felt such contempt for himself. He lies down on his bed. He's agitated, but he's crying so much that tears keep him from sleeping. And it seems for a moment, it seems for a moment as if he's changed. But then he does something that makes us realize that what he's really thinking is mischief managed. Because look what he does. To avoid unnecessary rumors, he locks the letter in the safe so nobody knows. You didn't change. You, you, okay. And then this, my friends, is classic Chekhov. Is to just leave it and not tell the reader what was supposed to happen. In fact, Chekhov said one time, just explicitly said one time, it's not the author's job to do the reader's work for him. The reader needs to do their own work. The reader needs to find the meaning themselves. Well, thank you, Anton. And I think you can answer, is the banker really changed? Like some people read the fact that he was had contempt for himself and that he was crying as a sign that he changed from his capricious ways. And then other people, and I guess I've already kind of revealed that I'm in the second camp, I feel that by hiding the note away shows that he didn't really change. Like he was in that moment softened, but it wasn't permanent. Do you think the lawyer changed his views on the death penalty versus life in prison? So do you think that the lawyer, the one who was in prison, and he was the one who said that life in prison was more inhumane than the, the death penalty, do you feel like that's, that that's been proven? Do you feel like he has changed his views on that? I'm curious about whether you think he's changed his views. And I wonder if what you think about how the lawyer would feel about the fact that no one but the banker saw his letter. Like, do you think that would bother him? Or do you think he wouldn't care because he doesn't care about anything in the world? What do you think about that? Do you think he would care? How do you think he would feel about that? All right, so there are three different interpretations of this ending. You can pick one, any one. You can believe that either the banker is a changed man who goes on the rest of his life knowing better, being less capricious and more thoughtful. Either the evil wins and the banker remains unchanged and the whole thing was just a waste of everyone's life. Or you can have another belief that you want to focus on the lawyer. Like, what happens to the lawyer? We, we don't hear anything. Like, where does he go from here? Like, do you... Do you, does he do what the banker says where he gets married and lives a happy life? Can any of you see the lawyer really living a happy life after this? I'm not sure. Where do you go from here? Okay. This was, I don't know why this is, I don't, we don't need this slide. That was from another one. Sorry about that extra slide. All right. 
<clears throat> sweet 16, Jaron phrases. This is our last of the sweet 16. So um, I would, I would like to give this one some love. I love Jaron phrases. So Jaron's are a group of words acting like a noun and they begin with an ing word. They always begin with a verb ending in ing. And the ing word is usually followed by a noun or a prepositional phrase, but Jaron's can stand by themselves. I'll show you an example of that. They can be the same parts of a sentence as a noun phrase. So um, here's a Jaron phrase acting like a subject. And we did noun phrases yesterday, so you're going to see some similarity. So you see this, buy, to buy is a verb, but when we say buying, books that's a gerund phrase because this is acting as a noun it is the act of buying but it is the thing that is buying books the idea of buying books and that's a noun so buying books is my favorite way to spend money buying here is functioning as a noun not a verb and that's what a gerund is a gerund is a verb acting like a noun and it they end in ing so reading books in the bathtub that's a gerund. It's not a verb. It is a noun form called a gerund. It's fun until the book falls in. I know about that. My, I'm reading the seventh Harry Potter in the bathtub right now, and it's fallen in twice. All right. Um, going to the grocery store is an adventure. So you see, these are all acting as the subjects of these sentences. Then let's go to another example of a gerund acting in a different, um, in a different form. Here's a gerund acting like a direct object. His mother loves watching him vacuum. Like she, what does she love? She loves watching him vacuum. The Hobbit loved eating and staying at home. What does the Hobbit love? Eating and staying at home. If you can, if you, this is the direct object of the verb loves. What is, what is they, what do they love? Being in the army requires doing a lot of push-ups. What does it require? It requires doing a lot of push-ups. So it's a direct object of those verbs. Here it is acting like a subject complement. My biggest weakness, what is your biggest weakness? It's buying books. Her only fear was pub speaking in public. What was her fear? Speaking in public. A disastrous plan involved ignoring all of the warnings. What, were, what was the disastrous plan? Ignoring all the warnings. Now, and it can also be, oh, this says noun clause. It should say, um, sorry, it should say Jaren phrase. Sorry, woo, lots of mistakes. The doctor worked hard at protecting her patients. He loves reading about traveling to Canada. Her interest in running began early. Notice all those that look like verbs, but they're they're gerunds. Okay, and some of you are like, Mrs. Van, they sound like participial phrases. They're ending in, they've got those ing words, so how is it different? Okay, so they are different, although I know, I understand that you could get confused by that because they're easy to confuse because they both have ing words. Participial phrases have ing words and so do gerunds. The difference is that a gerund phrase will always function as a noun. A gerund phrase will always function as a noun, whereas a participial phrase will describe another word in the sentence. It will give additional description about another word in the sentence. So here's our gerund phrase, jamming too many clothes in the washing machine will ruin your clothes, right? Here it's the subject of the sentence, jamming too many clothes in your washing machine. In the participial phrase, jamming too many clothes in the washing machine, Javier made the water overflow. So it's the same phrase, but in this one, it's functioning as a participial phrase because it's describing Javier. What, what is Javier doing? He's jamming too many clothes in the washing machine. So if, you can always tell the difference because they will function as a noun 100% of the time. They will not be describing something else in the sentence. Now, you can have a gerund without any other words. You don't have to have a gerund phrase. We're doing gerund phrases, but you don't have to do that. Um, so thank you for pulling out the typos because I'll go back and fix those. Um, his running is getting on her nerves or he likes running. You can have a gerund that's just one word. And if you remember early on in the class, I said before a gerund, you have to have a possessive. And do you see how it says his running is getting on her nerves? You just say that and you would say, or you would say her running, not, you wouldn't say he running is getting on her nerves. It's his. You have to use the possessive form before the gerund. Um, so you can do a gerund by itself, not in a whole phrase. All right, so we're going to do, you're going to make a gerund poem. And I'm going to show you an example. So I'm going to start by, I'm thinking of Disneyland and some things that people do at Disneyland. They buy tickets to Disneyland. They ride on rides. They watch the parade. They lose their kids. They feel happy. Okay, so then what I can do is, Disneyland is, and then I put in these gerunds. 
buying tickets, riding rides, watching parades, feeling happy. These are these ideas associated with it. And, uh, it, and the reason that these are gerunds is because they are the complement. What is Disneyland? They are the subject complement here. They are, described, they are defining what Disneyland is. All right, so your turn. I want you to think of an event or place where people are doing a lot of things, and I want you to think of some of those things. So it could be the grocery store. It could be an amusement park. I pick like Disneyland. It could be a famous landmark. It could be school. School would be fine. Um, anywhere where people are doing a lot of actions. And Christine says, how do you remember all these types of phrases? Well, Christine, I'm an English teacher. So I, I, I have an undergraduate degree. So I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in English. So I studied English for six years in college. And then I taught it for a lot of years. But also, I don't think you have to remember the names. Like, I don't think the names are important. I think what's important is to understand what are these tools and how can you use them and recognize different types of phrases and clauses that you can put into your writing to enrich it. So think of a place. Okay, think of some of those things. And now what I want you to do is construct your poem. So think of your place, traveling. I see somebody says traveling, Universal Studios, school. Okay. And then now I want you to come up with at least four gerunds that describe what that thing is. So I'm putting my example back up there again for you so that you can see it. Costco, that's a good one. Costco is, right? Sol oh, okay, Ryan Whitmore. Solitary confinement is driving me crazy, giving me a headache, making me stink. Nice. Costco is, I want to see that one. Universal Studios is looking at everything, buying butter beer, using the wand, riding awesome rides. Nice. Heidi Davis Disneyland is closed yeah no um <laughs> cookies like english teacher using the word things me what after all this time <laughs> yeah well i've been showing them to you so that you could distinguish them but i don't expect you to remember all of these names i just expect you to know now and see at least maybe just some interest in it like that there's some there's some way to add some richness to your writing disneyland is collecting germs waiting in line watching people meeting friends Middle Earth is having adventures, eating 10 meals a day, meeting hobbits and dragons, destroying Sauron, and seeing the beautiful places of Rivendell. That is nice. Nicely done, you guys. I know I'm going to have fun reading those. Thank you. All right. Looking at this story through the lens of justice is kind of interesting because there's a lawyer and they're talking about the death penalty, which is all justice. In fact, the American Bar Association has a lesson plan based on this story. My question for you is, who wins the bet? Who wins the bet? All right, I'll let those come in and we will jump into our writing rock stars. So um, through eighth grade, first sample. Okay, in this example, this sixth grader totally nailed it. You know what? Let me Let me go back for just a second because... I want to, I'll just stop here for just one second. I hope, maybe I'll go back even more. Here we go. I want to wrap up this story. I don't want to just move on so abruptly from the story. I hope that what you got out of the story was the idea that you don't have to understand everything. I don't understand. I tried to point out to you places where I don't understand it. I hope that you got out of the story that you don't have to understand everything for it to have meaning for you. And I also hope that you got out of it that you can... Think deeply about things that you can't even necessarily relate to in your own life. Like none of us can, well, we probably can more now than we could before relate to being locked up for 15 years, but most of us can't really imagine what that would be like and what we would do. But we can through reading. And I hope, I wanted to end with this story, even though now it's not going to be the end because we're going to have another story. But I wanted to end with this story because I wanted you to be able to see that there's so much depth and richness in these stories and there are so many short stories and your library will be full of them and even if you can't go to the physical library you can download the digital versions of them read more short stories and i think you all i have seen in your writing that you understand them you have the power to deconstruct them in a way to make meaning for you in your life and i think that through that you can gain the wisdom in a way healthier way than the lawyer did, but just as effectively. I think you can. And I, I hope this, this story has shown you. I cannot rate to go see who you think won. 
All right, so let's look at this sixth grader. This sixth grader nailed this topic sentence. The women's coping strategy of saying bad things about their house to make them feel better about potentially moving was not effective because they still felt really sad and hurt at the thought that they had to leave. This is what you do. You need, you get to the point and you tell the reader what you're going to prove. Not just it wasn't effective, but why, right? This is the opening sentence and this is a powerful, effective opening sentence. Bam. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Any of you who've had me comment on there, you need a stronger opening sentence. This is, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a response to the prompt and where you say something about it. Tell me what you're going to prove. Okay, next example. This is a seventh grader who has this opening sentence. There was actually another sentence before it, um, which is fine. And they said, this was ineffective because although they expressed that they were glad to leave the house on the outside, on the inside, they all knew that they were going to miss the house dearly. Absolutely. Now the writer will just add quotes from the story to support that and analyze those quotes to show how they prove that. Once you've got a solid opening, you are so ahead of the game. It is the most important thing in the piece. It is the most important thing. Okay. So here is a beautiful opening sentence and then I'm showing the closing sentence from the same piece. This is an eighth grader. So I want you to see the connection between the opening and closing. Overall, the coping strategy of the women in the home in home is far from effective as none of the women are ever fine with leaving their home throughout the entire story. Not just it's not effective, but why isn't it effective? Beautiful opening. And now look at the closing. Now, this person has a lovely response where they go through and show examples from the text and analyze those examples. Look at this closing sentence. Obviously, the women's coping strategy fails for each and every one of them is so attached to their home that they simply cannot convince themselves to believe otherwise. This is critical. Look at this beautiful connection between the opening sentence and the closing sentence. If you've had me give you feedback that you need a stronger closing sentence that goes back to your opening sentence, this is exactly what I mean. And Honey Joy just said, it's like a hypothesis in science. Yes, in a lot of ways it is. In a lot of ways it is, except if you knew your hypothesis, if you knew the results of your hypothesis, right? But yes, nice. Okay, um, ninth through 10th. Although the fundamental ideas of home are very different in the lottery and home, place is very important in each. And I just think, bam, this is an eighth grader writing to the ninth and 10th grade prompt. Man, what a choice comparing home and the idea of home in the lottery. I mean, when you can prove something this disparate, it's like Christmas. I mean, it is, it's a lot easier to prove it when they're similar to each other. When you pick something so different than this and you do a good job at it and this person did, then that's amazing. Um, okay, so this one, this is the same, this is the concluding sentence to that same response. So let's let's look at the opening sentence. Although the fundamental ideas are home, are very different in the lottery and home, place is very important in each. Watch this. In this way, that is a nice Transition phrase showing conclusion. That's how I'm telling the reader, here's my conclusion. Because you've I because I've proven all of this, now believe that. The two stories seem almost opposite. Home emphasizing the importance of people and things that remind the characters of how much they are loved, and the lottery implying that home is in traditions and society. However, despite the reasons home revolves around place, both stories are about a place one can call home. So it is this beautiful acknowledgement of the contrast between the two stories and referencing everything that's been proven in the story before. Bam, this is an absolutely fantastic uh, concluding sentence. And now I'm gonna do something that I have not done before. Okay, and what I'm gonna show you is a complete response. Um, an eighth grader wrote a fantastic response that I think everyone could benefit from seeing in its entirety. Um, so this is it. So this is, um, the opening line in every story. There is an idea of what home means. Although the fundamental ideas of home are very different in the lottery and home place is important in each. Okay. So what I want to point out is if your length of your response is long enough, your opening can handle being a couple of sentences long. And this response is long enough to handle it. If your core response is only three or four sentences, don't use two sentences as an opening, right? Um, this is effective. Notice that the compare and contrast is set up right in the beginning, although the fundamental ideas are different, right? I've set up the compare and contrast right in the beginning. 
Okay, so in home, so next, next the writer begins a new paragraph with the first point. Now I'd change that, um, I'd change that semicolon or that colon to a period, but that's minor. Notice the text evidence that flows in this sentence. Okay, so in home, there's a special idea that forms home in the character's eyes, especially the mother's. Her only wish was that she could always have, quote, the talking softly on blah, blah, blah. Notice how it flows in a sentence. Her only wish was that she could always have, quote, blah, blah, blah. There's no need to say, in the story it says that, or the text says blank. You don't need that. Just put the quote right in your own writing. When you put it in quotes, that's how I know it's from the story. So some of you have seen me say, um, that some of you have seen me say, don't put quotes around stuff that's not from the story. Because some of you are using quotes to describe that you don't really believe it. Like you'll say home or, you know, happiness or something like that. In academic writing, don't do that because it confuses the reader because they think you are quoting the story. All right. And then the writer is now going to give analysis of the evidence. So this is the beginning of the paragraph that, and they, she gives the evidence that, that, Home, there's this special idea of home and this is what it was all those are just things which some may say are not as important as people but to this mother they are reminders of her family and friends the familiarity of the house and their neighborhood consisting of friends was home thus the thought of losing their home was equivalent that the thought of losing their house was equivalent to losing their home the writer is now giving analysis of the text that was quoted this is what is wanted this is what is needed in this kind of response. I hope you can see the difference between opinion and analysis. This person isn't giving opinion. They're giving analysis. Analysis is reasoned, supported opinion. Not just random, I think, but saying this is what the text reasonably proves. Notice this closing sentence of the paragraph. Thus, the thought of losing the house was equivalent to losing the home. That's a key. It says that that transition word tells me, see, Mrs. Van, I want you to notice that I just proved something here. See how I proved my point? Okay, then this is the beginning of the next paragraph. This is the topic sentence of the next paragraph. It's a new idea. And so putting it in a new paragraph is the absolute right way to look at it. Why don't I ever say the author's name, Mrs. Van Star? I do that because um, I don't say the author's name because I don't have their permission to do that because this, this video goes public on YouTube. And so I don't have permission to do that. And so I don't use their actual name. I just use their grade. So yeah, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to protect your identity. Um, so the lottery is very different um, in the, the characters have completely different thoughts about what home means. This is so nice. It's a new idea. They put it in a new paragraph and it clearly states the purpose of the paragraph. I read this topic sentence and I can easily tell what I'm expecting to see. And when you make it easier on the reader like that, it's easier for them to give you full credit. To them, meaning the people in the lottery, home is all about tradition and keeping a perfect society rather than the people, places, or things that remind them of loved ones. In nearby towns, there was talk of giving up the lottery. Since tradition means home to most residents, moving to a neighboring town without a lottery would mean leaving not just their houses, but also their homes. Okay, so here there's a more subtle use of textual evidence where it's paraphrased rather than quoted. So this is considered evidence from the text. You can paraphrase evidence from the text. I like to see at least one quote from the text but the rest of the time, you're welcome to use um, paraphrasing. It's fine. But notice it is a direct reference to the story. You can tell that the person is using examples from the story. It's not just random. Again, the last sentence showing conclusion. Since transition, I'm sorry, since tradition means, right? This is how I proved this. All right. And then now we get the conclusion. And in the conclusion, the author acknowledges the differences and then makes the final argument. In this way... The two stories seem almost opposite. Home emphasizing the importance of people and things that remind the characters how much they are loved and the lottery implying that home is in traditions and society. However, despite the reason home revolves around place, both stories are about a place one can call home. And so this, I'd probably massage this last line, to be honest. I'd probably massage that last line. But this is a truly beautiful response. There is a pattern to the response. It is supposed to be a compare and contrast prompt, and this person does it beautifully. And uh, I just felt like it might be valuable to you to see an entire prompt in its entirety rather than just a piece of it. 
Um, and I just think it was really great. Um, yeah, so there we go. Okay, so your writing prompt for today. Okay, um, explain what this story, meaning the bet, has to say about the wisdom or lack of it of gambling and how even if you win, you may lose. If you are in ninth or 10th grade, I want to hear whether either character comes out as a clear winner. Have either of them proven their point, right? I want evidence. And if you want to write to the 11th or 12th grade prompt, or if you are in 11th or 12th grade, I want you to prove which character is more static and which is more dynamic, which is which character is most changed and which is most the same. So... Um, and then let me go back and you will put those in that I'll, I'll upload it in a few minutes. You'll put it in the bet folder. Again, this is the link to the next story. I want to address briefly something I just saw in the comment, which is somebody saying, I've been doing all of these prompts and I'm still not where I want to be with my essays. And I would say that um, it, it, it takes a very long, it can, it doesn't always, it can take a very long time. I will say that um, those of you who are, those of you who are making the most improvement, and I said to my husband, I feel like some of you, when I look at what you wrote two weeks ago and what you're writing now, have made a full year of, of writing growth in two weeks, which boggles the mind, but I've seen unbelievable exponential growth in many of you. I've seen so many of you gain so much confidence in people who didn't have any text evidence now embedding quotes. I mean, it, I, I said to my husband last night, I just wonder what some of their teachers are going to think when they go back to school and they're just blowing it out of the water with their writing. I mean, you're doing so well. But this is what I would say to those of you who are frustrated that it's not moving as fast as you want. And that is that you need to slow down. Slow down. You're not taking enough time to think about what have I said, commenting not only on your previous responses, but also what you've seen in the end of the of the discussions each day. Like sh when you see the exemplars, you should be looking at how can I mimic that? Like how could I make mine more like that? Not copying, but looking to them for that structural information. You need to be looking at structure. You need to be slowing down to take the time to make sure that your conventions are correct. And Ryan asks in the writing prompt, can you prove that neither change? Yes, absolutely. That's fine. Um, make sure that you're taking time with conventions. So I can tell that some of you aren't doing any revising. And the way that I can tell that is because there's blue squiggle lines that Google is giving you and you're ignoring them and not even trying to fix the grammar that's already being pointed out to you that's wrong. So make sure that you're taking some time. Make sure that you are making the effort to read it out loud. Read the thing out loud so that you know what it sounds like to the reader. If you did that, you would catch so many of these things because you would realize it doesn't sound right, right? So I think that you also need to be patient with yourself and avoid completely avoid that, woe is me, I'm so bad at writing. That's just not helpful. I mean, that is just not helpful. That's the exact opposite of what you should do because all it is really is a cop out because anybody can write. Anybody can write. You, if you can speak, you can write and you don't even have to speak and you can still write. So, but you, you can write, you can put your thoughts on paper in an organized fashion. You can, it does take practice and you need to have the right attitude, which is that if I practice, I can get better and you can, I think it's a lot to expect of yourself to go from needing a lot of work on writing to being perfect in two weeks. Right? So I think you need to also look at the metrics, right? Don't worry about, did my writing get shared by Mrs. Van in class? Because remember, I've said this over and over again. If somebody, if I have, if I already have graded some that have examples, not graded, but evaluated some that already have examples of what I want to show, and I've had different things I wanted to show each day. If I already have an example for that, even if yours was better, I'm not going to go substitute it in the PowerPoint just because of time. And so it's not about whether yours gets pointed out. It's about, can I grow from this experience? Can I do this? And so if you only just fix one little thing each time, and maybe for some of you who are really like overwhelmed by the process, 
start with one thing. Say, I'm going to work on having a really good topic sentence and that's all I'm going to focus on. And put a note to me in there. Like, I'm just focusing on the topic sentence. What do you think about that? Right? And don't try to make the whole thing better overnight in one fell swoop. Consider working on one thing at a time. Work on one thing and once you've got that down, then make this better and then another thing and make that better. And um, it out. And you can, you can always go back and revise them. It, even if you downloaded it, put it back in, right? There's, you can do it if you want to. If you do want me to look at it again, um, make sure to, to let me know, right? Like send me an email or something. So I think that everybody I've seen in the chat, I haven't seen anybody in the chat who I feel like can't become a truly excellent writer. And I can tell that because of your ideas. That's what writing is. Learning all of the conventions, learning the rules, learning the syntax, learning the patterns that go with this, that's all just um, in your toolbox. And you'll get that with time. It's the ideas that are hard to invent. And you guys have that in spades. So don't be down on yourself. It doesn't help you. It gets in your way. So don't do that. And don't expect so much of yourself that it's unreasonable, right? Okay, so I'm looking forward to reading your writing. I'm going to go put the prompt in the folder right now. And Monday, 12 p.m. Central Time, same channel. Um, and I will see you guys then.